All right, welcome to another video. Uh, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the different uh, ways of installing software in Linux besides just using the software manager here um, and talk about some of the different types of installation files you might run into. Um, I know when I was new with using Linux and I, it was something that when I uh, transitioned over from Windows, um, it was a little bit uh, confusing and intimidating for me at first to try and figure out how to install certain software. Now, uh, that said, that was many years ago and the process is a lot smoother these days than it was back then. There's a lot wider variety of options and they do make it quite a bit easier now than they used to, but and nonetheless, I just thought I would talk about some common formats and uh, as you're, you know, getting used to using Linux, and, you know, you've mainly been a Windows user the, this whole time, uh, you know, recently making the switch or whatever. This should help you with a little bit of understanding of how uh, to deal with certain things you might run into, especially when you're trying to find software that you can't get from the built-in software manager in Linux Mint or the equivalent in your uh, version of Linux that you're using. So I just have a quick search here. And briefly, when I was recording my OBS Studio, uh, video, I mentioned that there's a flat pack version and a regular version. Uh, what I didn't mention in that video though, uh, the, the, the one disadvantage to flat packs, yes, they are huge in file size by comparison, but, uh, but the advantage of a flat pack, or at least the idea with it, is that it contains all of the software that it, uh, requires as dependencies, like built right into this installation file. So, um, I'm not sure exactly what the reasoning behind the much larger file size is. Um, I remember, I, th I think I read something about it like back when Flatpak was kind of new, um, but it's something to do with the fact that like it has to be of a certain minimum size or something, I think. Uh, but at any rate, um, the nice part about the Flatpaks is that, you know, if you do have the storage space, if it's not a concern to you at all, um, you know, if you've got multiple terabytes free and, and you don't really care about, you know, another gigabyte or two or whatever, um, then going that route will ensure that you have everything uh, re built right into this installation file that you would need. You won't have to fetch any other, uh, you know, dependency software or things like that. So, um, so that is one nice advantage to it. But I personally would still recommend... Uh, if you can, if you do have the option for that software, to use just the regular, if you're, especially if you're installing from the software manager here, uh, to get just the regular install because it's just so much less space. And it will usually prompt you like, okay, if you need, you know, these other, uh, you know, packages to, to be able to work with, you know, to be able to get this software to work, it usually will prompt you about them and install them for you right as you go to install it uh, through the software manager. So... Um, but I just wanted to briefly uh, briefly cover that again because I realized that I forgot to mention in the other video uh, what the advantages are, what the distinct uh, purpose for having this uh, flat pack be, you know, uh, from the flat hub, uh, what the what the advantages and and the idea behind it is. So, um, but if so, let's say you know the software you want to use isn't in the software manager. Uh, on your system or maybe the version that's in the software manager is really outdated and you just want to get the you know the newest one from their website so uh, so assuming that's not what you use uh, I've got for example here OpenShot this is what I use a video editor that I use for editing my videos um, there's also Kden Live is another very popular uh, option I used to use that one before I found out about OpenShot um, but more recently, I've been using OpenShot because I just find this a little bit easier to use. Um, and, and so uh, I, I prefer that now. Um, so I'm on their website here, uh, just openshot.org. And uh, you can see here, I just went to the download up at the top. And since I'm on Linux, it, you know, it automatically detects that. Uh, obviously, if you're on Windows, it'll it'll pull up the Windows version. But you can see here it says Linux and it's in a 64-bit and it says app image. So it says app, in, app image requires no installation, just download, make executable, and run. So I feel personally, um, of course time will tell, but <laughs> but I feel like app in, app image installation, uh, you know, of software is sort of the future for Linux. Um, at least I kind of hope that's where things are eventually going to go, um, because 
it's really interesting. Uh, the, and I'm not even sure how it works. It's magic, but but basically everything that it needs is automatically installed, or not installed, but it's automatically included with this download. Um, and when you go to run it, you don't actually need to install anything. It's just in a self-contained file. So if you, um, you know, if you're going to get, uh, you know, whatever software it is, whether it's OpenShot or something else on Linux and they have a Linux version and it's just an app image like we've got here. Um, you may be wondering, well, what do I do with that? You know, how do I, how do I work with that? But, but it's actually really simple and I'll show you here. I have a folder open. Um, I've got a couple different kinds that we'll look at here. Um, but we can see here OpenShot. So this is the one I just downloaded from their site and it's an app image. So, um, pretty much what this does is it just downloads literally this file onto your computer and it's not even an installation file or anything. It's it's just the entire software uh, contained in this one file right here. Um, so when it says make executable, what that means is you actually have to go in and change the setting. So uh, if you right click on it and you go down to properties, at least in Linux Mint, this is how it works. It'll probably work this way in Ubuntu as well um, and maybe some others. Uh, you can go over here to this permissions tab in the properties. You can see here, you go ahead and click. And then you see some options here and you can see right here, it says execute, it says allow executing file as a program. So you just want to check that box and that's a uh, set it and forget it kind of setting. So once you've checked it once, you don't need to check it again for that, uh, for this, you know, software application. And so I go ahead and hit close after that, once the box is checked. And now when you go to run this, double click on it and it will actually run it as an application. And you can see there it is, uh, here's, open shot and it's just running straight from that it, it's it's as if it was an exe file to run uh you know on on windows um but it was it's all self-contained in uh you know in just this one file so i'm gonna go ahead and close out that but that's literally all you need to do so whenever you see an app image that's it this is it this is the file you download you go back in here you right click go to properties hit permissions allow executing it as a program then you just double click and it runs straight from this uh, this app image file here. So it's very convenient. It's very portable. I mean, you can literally copy the whole software over just by, you know, to a storage device or something. All you have to do is move this file. That's it. Uh, so I personally would love to see this be the way of <laughs> the future for Linux. I mean, it's already catching on uh, pretty well, I think. But I would love to just see almost every software work through an app image personally. I think it's great because it's just so convenient and, and portable, but, um, and it's self-contained too. It's not, it doesn't need a whole bunch of extra stuff and, you know, uh, all these dependencies and sometimes the dependencies are no longer available if it's an older app or, you know, whatever. You don't have to worry about that with the app image. It's just, there it is right here in this file. It runs from this. And that's it. You don't need a complex directory structure. You don't need, you know, a bunch of other dependencies. It's all just contained in here. Uh, but in the event that you don't have an app image or maybe you don't prefer them and that's fine There's plenty of other options out there. You may run into some other ones like here. Uh, this is a It's called media info tab. This is a something of an extension for uh, functionality in Linux Mint specifically um, What it does is it makes it so you can uh, right click on a file say like a video or, or a music file or something like that and it will give you more information than Linux does by default about that um, particular file's properties. So like the bit rate for the video and the audio codecs that it used and, and information like that uh, related to the media uh, of its, you know, whatever its media is, um, it will give you a different uh, additional information for that on a, t on a separate tab when you right click and go to properties. Uh, but so a DEB package, it's short for DB and I assume, um, so any Debian based uh, Linux distribution, so Ubuntu or Linux Mint for sure, um, you can use these. And these are probably the closest thing to uh, a Linux version of an, an uh, exe file, an executable file for Windows. So, so if you're used to like a setup.exe or something like that from Windows, uh, when you download, this is pretty similar to that. Uh, so just go ahead and double click on a Debian file and you can see here, um, it, it brings up this this window here and it says requires an installation of five packages. So uh, here it's just telling you there's extra things you need to download in order for this to work. Um, but it will take care of that. 
I mean, you can see like who the maintainer is. So it's the person that creates this particular uh, software media info tab. Um, you know, this file size that it's going to take up and it says view media information from the properties tab. So if there's more stuff, you know, if it's a more complex thing, it'll tell you down here, it's a, sort of a description, but pretty much all you do with these uh, DBM files, DEB files, whatever, uh, you just click here where it says install package. And, and then it's going to ask you for your system password. So we go ahead and type that in. And when you've got your password typed in there, uh, it'll give you this prompt here in this case because it says there's additional packages. It says, please take a, look, take a look at the list of changes below. And it's just showing you the other packages that it needs to install in order to function. Um, so you just go ahead and hit continue if you get that prompt. Um, if there aren't other dependency packages, then you won't see this one most likely. Um, and it will just start. And it's going ahead and going through the installation process here. And that will just take a few seconds. And it's gathering all those uh, additional packages as well that it needs to function. And then when it's done, you can see it says same version is already installed. So this is kind of convenient um, in that if you don't remember exactly what version you have and you go to download it again or something, or if you didn't remember that you installed it, maybe it would tell you this. And if you have an older version, it will say older version is installed and then you can, you know, uh, update it to the newer version or, or whatever. Or if you need to reinstall it, you can use that here. But that's pretty much the all you have to do for when you get a, a DBM file like that. Um, and as you can see, it's a pretty simple process. This is basically the installer for it. At this point, you don't need to keep this file. Like the app image, you do need to keep these around because this is literally how you run the software. This is the software itself. So these you have to keep uh, handy. But at this point, unless you, you know, um, wanted to install it again you don't need this particular file it's all installed so this is pretty much just the installer um, versus the you know the one that actually makes the software run itself um, so and so that's another one you'll commonly find and if you're on uh, one of the appropriate uh, debian based distributions of linux this is another easy way to get software installed um, it's, it's fairly straightforward as you just saw it's it's not too complicated you just basically run it hit the install button and hit ok and then you're done and it's set up so um, if there are ever any errors with it it will prompt you as well usually it'll be like if it's too old of a software and it's not compatible with your version of Linux anymore or something like that it, it'll tell you like unable to find the dependency packages or, or things like that but um, for, for the most part it's pretty smooth to use these um, and the other one that you may commonly uh, find is this tar.bz2. Now, this is an old one in a way. Um, so I remember running into these when I was new to Linux many years ago. And it was very, like, at, back then it was intimidating. It's like, oh, gosh, what do I do with this? Because there was a whole process you had to go through and, and things like that. But really, to be honest with you, anytime you see this tar.bz2, this is pretty much just an archive file. It's the same thing as... On Windows, if you find a zip file or, or a RAR file, something like that, it's the same kind of thing. It's just a slightly different format of it. It's it's an archive. So if you're not familiar with what archives are, you can think of them like a storage container with stuff inside of it. It's, it's pretty much the, the storage container. It's one file that contains things inside of it. And you can see uh, even with, you know, with this particular version of Linux and Mint here, uh, even the image kind of shows you it's like it's a storage box and it's got tape on it that's the that's the image they use to to show you what this is and so by default uh, linux mint is able to um, do things with archive files it knows what they are it knows how to handle them so if you just double click on it you can see we've got archive manager here and this is the software by default in linux mint that uh, handles archives and it and it opens everything and you can see what's inside of it that's what it's doing right now it's it's reading the contents of it and then here we go, we can see there's a folder and inside of that folder, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So really all you really need to do with these when you have the tar.bz2s is if you just think of it like a zip file, if you're familiar with those on Windows, this is the same thing. Just right click on it, go down here where it says extract here. And all that's doing is unpacking all the files that were in there into that in that archive file. And it will put them in the same location of wherever this file is. So I would say put this where you want to have the software installed, basically, because uh, that's what that does. 
and and you can see here it created the folder and now it's taking all the rest of the files out of you know that were inside that folder and just putting them out here um, and when that process is finished and there it goes now we can see here's this folder and I'll just click into it and you can see here's the software itself um, in this particular case uh, you actually run this lossless cut software here by by uh, using this particular file here and you know depending on what you've got it's going to maybe look a little different but um, but this is just one example just to show you that it, it's not that intimidating it's just like a basic zip file it's a bunch of files stored inside of one file you can automatically have Linux man and Ubuntu and things like that uh, they will automatically know to that they can extract them with this option here um, even if you didn't do that you can still open them up this way and it's going to take a little bit to read it but you could take them out and use you can see this extract option here you can do it that way as well um, if for some reason you didn't have the extract here on the right click menu or whatever you can just click on here and go to extract and then it will you know go through that process as well so um, it's not too challenging when you just think of it in those terms um, and you know again depending on what software exactly you're using using it from here may look a little different um, you may actually have to still do some setup or something but but um, generally though most of the time when you find it in a you know tar bz2 whatever it's just like a zip file it's a basic archive you unzip it your whatever you extract it in this case that's that's the, the better terminology it applies to more things um, and that's it and this you can then delete this because it's all contained in here um, so you don't need to keep this one around at that point unless you want to um, you could always add it right back into an archive if you need to any folder on Linux Mint just right click go down here to compress and then you can make it you know name it whatever you want you can put it in a tar.gz you can put it in a tar.bz2 a 7-zip you can put it into a regular zip whatever you need whatever format you need here there's a whole bunch you could choose um, uh, dot 7z if you use 7zip on windows that's another one so by default uh, Linux Mint knows what to do with pretty much all that stuff and all you would do is just hit create and it would put it back into uh, you know a, an archive file similar to this one um, so you can always go both ways with it um, so at that point you would just delete this one and you don't really need it um, but that's just to show you um, you know an overview to show you some of the common uh, ways that especially if you're going on to a website and you're just trying to download um, you know you're just trying to download software from a website that's not necessarily maintained in the software manager and you know in the official repositories and things like that um, but just um, to keep an eye out for like the app image and the Debian files um, and you know and even if you have to the the, the archive files too um, just some other ways to handle those and how to get your software installed that you need uh, so I hope this was helpful for you and I'll see you all in the next video